Cross execution environments um, from a very high level are like, as Andrew said, these secure machines. So you can imagine a computer inside of a locked room with like a heavily armed bodyguard outside. Nobody's really going to get to that that machine, unless of course they have like even stronger bodyguards or something like that. But we'll get into that a little bit more. And it's not just uh, CPUs either. You can do they're like hardware accelerators, like confidential GPUs. So these are really just efficient ways of doing secure computing. And yeah, and we integrate those into on-chain networks, provide high integrity and high security decentralized applications. I guess I'll wrap up just with an example. I think most people do know what uh, these are at this point, at least in this room. But the example I like to give is, at least for people in crypto, uh, most of you have had or touched a hardware wallet or ledger or treasure device. These are essentially a, a T or like a secure enclave. They are only good for one purpose. They only, the only data that they hide within is a private key. The only computation that they do is generate a signature over that private key. But even technically, even if you have access to, to the physical device, um, even if you have like all the power in the world or maybe a lot of power, they're not actually able to extract the private data. Uh, and you can be pretty certain that it generates the right signature. And now T is like SGX, but all of the other ones are basically an expansion of that, right? You can, you can put any private data inside and you can run any kind of computation that you want. So for example, in secret, we use that to execute the smart contracts, the validators execute the smart contracts inside of the enclave so that they don't actually see the data that they're operating on. Gotcha, thank you for that explanation. And then the risk of sounding too basic, um, how many of you here in the room don't have smartphone mobile telephone devices? <laughs> okay, how many of you can log in with your fingerprint, or how many of you cannot log in with your fingerprint or your face? Wow, that's super secure. Good for you. Um, well, I, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the, the, the information, the data about your fingerprint, about your face is also in a secure enclave within your device. So whether or not you believe you're using TEEs today, everyone in this room basically is, except maybe you. <laughs> correct, right? Am I, am I? Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't want to exaggerate anything. Here. Okay, so um, I think Andrew, you touched upon something that was pretty interesting because you know now we understand the trusted execution its environments themselves are kind of like a broad class of hardware technology, and there's specific implementations of that, whether it's on your Apple iPhone or Intel SGX, and then we had also mentioned um, AMD Trust Zone, and you had also talked about like why people aren't using um, or are more so using Intel SGX at least in the Web3 space. But I'm curious to know, do you guys see any sort of activity with Trust Zone or like why, like, yeah, why not? All right, let's take this one. Uh, so, uh, so Arm Trust Zone, Arm Trust Zone is like kind of a, not a fully made trust execution environment. So like you have um, these layers of trust execution. One is you have the secure enclave, like a physical processor that actually does the computation and you need to harden that so that people can't take secrets off while the machine is running. Then you need to secure communications with the outside world. So for instance, your computer's memory. And for that, you need a, uh, some, some encryption engine between the CPU and memory. So you do encryption there. And then the third thing, which is what Trustune has not really had as much as SGX and AMD SEV and others, is remote attestation. So as Andrew mentioned, you, this ability to prove that you're running the program in a secure environment is actually crucial to establishing trust in both the hardware and the software running on it. Yeah, I mean, I think the remote attestation is really, well, so there, there are two reasons why I think most projects uh, are so secluded of uh, resorting to SGX. Uh, it's been the most uh, well documented, it's been the first, but it was the only one that was really feature complete, right? And remote attestation is the big one. Again, remote attestation is really like, a, let's say, if you trust the enclave, then it essentially is like, a, a zero knowledge proof of correctness, of correct execution. You do something in the enclave, you sign it, um, and you attest with that signature that uh, it was, everything was run correctly, again, as long as you trust the underlying uh, T. So it's very important, it's very efficient, it's, it's literally crucial, like in secret, for example, when a validator joins in the network, they actually have to kind of prove to everyone that they're going to run everything and generate keys and all that within a, a well-patched uh, trusted execution environment. 
Like you literally cannot operate without it. Um, it's interesting to think about what other technologies or what other things uh, we can do to actually you know, bridge the gap, like we do something like uh, AMD today. I think there are solutions. I don't think this is, uh, this is like, something we can do. Um, but I think that's, that's the main reason. Um, I think another up and coming uh, enclave uh, that is making a lot of waves is uh, AWS Nitro. Um, I think one of the problems there is that you're kind of tied into the AWS uh, cloud services. This probably works better in the enterprise setting than the Web3 setting, but uh, there is a lot more work in T's, and I do think T's are actually just starting out. But I think uh, they should not be overlooked, and if, you know, if, if I can make a hopeful prediction is that 10 years from now we have dozens, if not like hundreds of implementations of T's, and most importantly, open source ones that can be updated and broken and, and patched and, and improved like, uh, in pretty much real time. And maybe we could introduce and talk about your projects a little bit more, because I think um, you know, there's lots of uses of, of trusted hardware, like the you know, hardware wallets, your, your, your phone use. Um, what I'm most interested in, and you know, what your projects both do, is about how to have um, privacy-preserving smart contracts that are fully programmable privacy, full ability to the developer to control what's revealed, what's not revealed, for smart contracts running on a blockchain, right? So um, in Ethereum, Blocks run, you know, validators run the transactions, even forget how they're ordered. Once they're done ordering and committed in a block and then published, everyone can execute those transactions and step through them in a debugger and see every step. It's all plain text, it's all transparent. And if you want to have privacy preserving smart contracts, the idea of using TEs for that is that these validator nodes, anyone who, who, who's running it, is only executing the smart contract within the enclave. So the smart contract can have private state that can't be seen by everyone. If it outputs something to a user or outputs a ciphertext encrypted to a user, sure, it can communicate to the outside world like that. Um, but by being in the enclave, it will be private by default. And I think that's the premise uh, I mean, that's applicable to both Oasis and to Secret and how they use it. Awesome, yeah. So, you know, touching upon executing in a private confidential computing environment and no one having access to that, I think we'll, we'll get right into that. And I hope that everyone now has a fundamental understanding of trusted execution environments. We're all experts here, so we can get a little more detailed. Um, and this is where things get really exciting. So Andrew, um, back in November, right, being the expert that he is at UIUC, uh, published a tweet regarding some vulnerabilities in SGX, and I guess like more so just like CPU architecture in general, right? And so like maybe we can kind of give the audience uh, a broad overview of like what a side channel attack is and how ubiquitous it is for like CPUs or SGX or just TEs in general. I, mean, I think the most important thing to understand, um, let me think how to break this down, but there's a couple components. So the TE, when it's used in um, TE-based smart contracts, like in Secret and Oasis, um, the, the Enclave is a program running in the CPU and the kind of isolation features are limited you know, to within the CPU, but that's only a portion of the system. What you have is the rest of the code around it in the kernel in other user space. That's called the untrusted host. It's this part of your code that's not in the Enclave. And the, you know, the, the CPU only has so much memory on the CPU, you actually have to use you know, disk, memory, network access, and that all has to go through the untrusted portion of the code, and that interface has to be uh, uh, really carefully guarded. Anything that is on that boundary between those um, could be a side channel. Um, what I think I would have tweeted about in November might have been about, um, well, it depends on the day, because there were like a sequence of uh, a couple different things. There were just days in November, yes. Maybe I can just you know, enumerate this. So there's three security issues that we've been um, looking at, and I could just go in kind of the sequence order of them. Um, so one of them is the idea of um, hardening. So SGX has had a history of these vulnerabilities. I mean, you, you could call this a side channel. Uh, the, the, the most recent one was APIC leak. Uh, apparently, that was the second most recent one, but it was the most recent one that I, I'm clearly aware of. And it's arguably a side channel. They call it an architectural side channel rather than a microarchitectural one. The classic side channels are like you need a fancy like oscilloscope probe or some kind of hardware access. You can like listen to the acoustic uh, you know, uh, perturbations and decrypt a key or something that way. So like difficult attacks. And um, Apic Leap was kind of stunning in its you know, scope because it was like a, a software bug, like a use after free bug. It's just an error in the design of the microcode that uh, you know, the processor would run. 
Um, but the result of it is that you could leak all of the data out, you could compromise all of the you know, guarantees that the, the trusted hardware enclave is um, supposed to have. Um, there's this process Intel goes through for patching the microcode when a vulnerability is detected, but there was like a gap between the time that the, the patches are enforced in this remote attestation layer and when it was um, published. So um, the, the kind of first thing on our, on our list of things to look at was when they pick leak happened, okay, which systems are still vulnerable to this? And, and there's an architectural difference between Oasis and Secret Network about the attack surface when an SGX vulnerability occurs. Um, in Oasis, a small number of nodes get to be the enclave owners and run uh, you know, code in an enclave. The rest have to um, you know, receive the data from them, but, but don't actually run the, the code in their enclave. You have to be a state validator, um, and even then, you only get um, like one contract by contract access to key material for that. And then the root keys are, are only held in like a distributed fashion. Um, and, and Secret Network takes a different approach. There's good trade-off reasons for this, but basically any node can join Secret Network if you have a you know, Intel chip that supports the, the, the right version of SGX. Um, so the attack surface was much larger. So the outcome of that analysis was that we could hook up a node to the Secret Network and break the key out of it by um, I'm not an expert in SGX or architecture, I'm a script kitty. We downloaded the APIC leak proof of concept and you know, twiddled with it a bit until it ran on the secret network enclave, dumping the secrets out of it. Um, and now, you know, this has since been patched, so the, that TCB recovery process, Intel's responsive, they've updated the microcode, and it's now no longer possible to take a vulnerable node and reconnect it to the network um, uh, through the remote attestation process. I will pause there, I said that I have, you know, three total, but, um, What's up? Sorry. You have to pause there and before going into others. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I know that this sort of, um, well, what happened in February, right? Like, I think this was something that Secret Network definitely took a lot of consideration into. So I'm curious to know, like, you know, in terms of the patching, right, how much of this was on Intel SGX's side to, from their team to actually patch the vulnerability versus, like, how much of it was from the Secret Network side? And how, how did the process sort of take place? Well, so the, this is a little bit what Andrew said. So the the patching at the end of the day, as Andrew alluded to, this was a, this was a hardware bug. Hardware bugs are very similar to software bugs, um, and they can be notoriously bad. This was, I think, the worst one that SGX has had, or like the second worst one, but I do think it was the worst one by far. Um, I less consider it a side chain, and even if technically that's that's the it's part of it. It's really, it's literally a bug, right? Like, like you expect the, the, the T to do something, it wasn't doing it at that point, and that could wreak havoc. Um, when it came to patching this, so, uh, by the way, if my biggest concern with T's right now, and especially with, the, let's say, the limited amount of T's out there, is A, that there, many of them are closed source, but B, that there's this lag. So if you have a software, like a software zero day, then usually, hopefully, there's a white head that, that uh, figures it out in time. You can very quickly patch it and upgrade it. But here you have like two layers of, of complexity. So even when Intel announces it, it has to get like enough OEMs and providers to basically enact the upgrade in their like motherboards and biases and then service providers like clouds and data centers, and that takes time. And to give all those providers time, they don't do what's called a TCB recovery. TCB recovery is a process where they say, okay, there's a path, there's a vulnerability, there's a patch. From this point on, like if you try to attest that you're running like good uh, enclave, we will say no, you're not good. And with, between that time and uh, window, that's where uh, Android and, and the other teams basically stepped in. And, um, and came to us and said, look, like, Intel hasn't done like, anything at that point, like, it's gonna take more time, and you guys are vulnerable. And uh, obviously at that point we went to like a two months sprint, I guess, to work with them, to kind of resolve it before even Intel can enact their own patch. Now, uh, to me the lesson, the, the main lesson is, okay, so from, from what we did is, and this is all public and you can read about it, there's, there's two things to say. A, uh, just like Andrew and others could pull out the secret material, because yes, that was a, that vulnerability could have been exploited, um, it's hard to say if no one else did, right? And that is a big deal, 
And that is something that anyone who's using a secret network should realize. But at the same time, we did everything we could to kind of figure it out. And we got a bit lucky because like, that bug was only introduced by Intel in like some of their like latest machines, and those were actually not enabled in secret for a long time. Um, and for that reason, very, very few machines were actually vulnerable. So I think we got lucky in that, and I, you know, there's no way to say for sure, and you should consider like everything potentially leak if you're users, but at the same time, I think we, we are under the belief that it's very, very unlikely that that leak. But I think we did everything that we could have done back then, and building on top of that, we did, we did some of the things that to me are really cool. So um, in a couple of days, we're gonna, there's gonna be a network upgrade. It's actually being voted right now by the entire network. And that upgrade is gonna actually uh, resolve several mitigations, uh, several, several issues, several vulnerabilities, um, and put like hardening and other aspects that are much better for the future. One of which, which I think is very critical, is this, uh, this ability to kind of have like a network-wide seed rotation. So you can kind of limit the scope of like any such of attack if they happen in the future by basically rotating the, the, the secret material in the network and completely invalidating like uh, everything that other people use. How do you do that? What? How do you like you read encryption? That sounds really expensive. Like I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's pretty complicated, and we thought we thought it was gonna take us like um, I think like a few weeks. That's what we're, the first the first time we said like oh this is gonna take us uh, three weeks, and it's uh, and it's it's pretty complicated, and we ended up working on it uh, three months. I'm not the best person to speak about the details. Uh, half of our engineering team was like spent the last three months on it. There's a, a perception about um, TEEs that uh, the message that I most want to convey is kind of a myth to dispel, which is that you know, there's almost two forms of it that almost mean the opposite. So one is that some people don't like thinking about TEEs or how to build systems based on TEEs because it's too easy. TE is so powerful, just solves the whole problem for you and the rest of the system's trivial. You just run it in the TE and it's automatically secure. And that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a ton of like, very interesting nuance in the design of systems built around the TEs. Um, so I mean, that aspect of it is you know, completely not true. I mean, in the other kind of form that this gets is a lot of people I think have seen this like terrible track record of vulnerabilities of, of SGX in particular and concluded that there's no hope of building any system based on TEs that has any security at all. And I don't think that's at all the right message. It's definitely not the message uh, that me trying to, to uh, uh, build an application on top of it um, um, have. I don't think anyone should have it either. I, I think the right message is actually that you need to be aware of the you know, proneness to vulnerability of these, um, but you just need to put extra work into the hardening and software design around it. You, you basically have to anticipate that there might be further vulnerabilities like this in the future. Uh, you know, mitigation like having a key rotation plan, or you know, having learned from this, and you know, have a plan to be very responsive in the case that there's a, you know, when not if there's an next vulnerability to respond to it. I think those are the things that you do to mitigate, you know, the the, the you know proneness to vulnerabilities of TEs. Um, but ultimately, I, I think it's the only um, it, it's the only approach right now that gives you the full kind of flexibility. Talking about zk proofs. There, there's a limit you can get to where if you want to do like an auction application that doesn't reveal anything even after the auction, ZK proofs are not enough for that. You either need to turn to multi-party computation or to trusted hardware enclaves. And you know, it kind of even if you use multi-party computation, the trusted hardware enclaves would be better off combined with it so that you have some evidence that the nodes aren't storing the key material that uh, you know they're supposed to get rid of you know, when they're done. So it, I, I think that the fact that there's such a negative perception around SGX and TEEs right now just means that there's um, you know, a huge opportunity and even low hanging fruit for people to uh, participate in. Awesome, yeah, I think Andrew touched upon a really good point here as well, right? Like, you know, thinking about zero knowledge proofs, thinking about homomorphic encryption, thinking about all these technologies, trusted execution environments, right? Like, I think it has to be pretty clear that it really depends on your use case, and analogously, you can kind of think of it as like a, a almost like full stack development, right? Whether you're building for a use case on the front end versus if you're building a use case on the back end, you're using different programming languages, you're using different 
approaches, architecture, right? Maybe you're more so focused on DevOps, et cetera. And like, it's pretty similar with like zero knowledge proofs and trusted execution environments, right? If you're looking for that confidential computing environment, there are limitations on the ZKP side that you know would require you to have other solutions as well. And so instead of thinking of it as like you know in like competition with one another, it's more so you know using applications such as like zero knowledge proofs, trusted execution environments, and building that sort of privacy environment, right? Even like when we saw the slide at the beginning on a zero or a layer zero side, right, with NIM, right? NIM addresses the mixnet and the VPN and metadata, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that's something that, you know, uh, a zero knowledge proof doesn't exactly address, right? And so like the, the I think the theme here is, you know, how you take all these different technologies and build end-to-end -end privacy, right? And so like different different types of I guess, quote unquote, technologies, right, apply to various uh, steps within that end to end privacy journey. Um, but yeah, we've got about five minutes left. And I think another thing that, you know, not to keep harping on you, Andrew, but you, you, you mentioned as well, which is, you know, like it, it, it is a little bit complex sometimes to build in trusted execution environments. But I think like the, the beauty of having these networks like Secret and Oasis is that that complexity is abstracted away from the developer. And so, you know, moving on to developers, right, like, how can a developer get started on your networks? Um, and you know, like what sort of use cases do you see are the most exciting there right now? Maybe to start? Yeah, so um, Oasis is a Solidity, uh, Ecom compatible network use program in, in Solidity. And I mean, the big point of developing on TE is, is that you should, you do need to think up and down the stack and like what kind of side channels are going to exist and how to mitigate them. But what we do at Oasis is we try to make the SDK really convenient for the use. Like what we're really going for is like extreme convenience where like you basically just write like straight line solidity. Don't think about micro architectural, architectural side channels, all these things like keys. You just store your stuff. So like um, things that we do are like um, ORAM with oblivious uh, memory so that you can't see like storage access patterns. We have act we're actively developing that. Uh, just making sure that gas usage is hidden, like all sorts of metadata privacy. So, like, at a, like a waste network, you just write solidity. That's what we're going for. So it's pretty simple. You just head over to docs, crack open hard hat, and then like write some solidity and deploy. You're good to go. Yeah. So on secret, it's uh, secret is a layer one by Cosmos blockchain. So if you're not familiar with Cosmos, the uh, the smart contract layer is done in Rust. Based on something called Cosmosm, so it's WebAssembly. Um, it's uh, very easy to get started. Like you, you can go on this uh, SCRT.network website and see the docs. There are like so many examples. There's a vibrant developer community. Uh, one thing that Secret has is it's been live for about two and a half years. So like there's so many people in the ecosystem building and so much to see and do. Um, and you can basically build anything, and it's kind of cool, right? Like you write a contract. It's uh, essentially right with the uh, limitations or advantages of trust execution environments. Essentially, all transaction data, so all input or all input data to the, to a to a smart contract are encrypted. All the state of the smart contracts are encrypted, and the outputs are encrypted. But the developer can selectively say, you know, what what uh, they want to reveal. So, for example, in a voting application. And we have several of those where people vote with the tokens, basically voting DAO. Then the the votes themselves are private, but then the the eventual tally is public. With NFTs, uh, you know the NFT can be you can have public metadata just like Ethereum, but you can also have private metadata, and then only the owner of the NFT can uh, see the private metadata and delegate access to. Uh, just in like one more sentence, something that I'm very interested in, it kind of ties back to what we've been saying today, is I think a lot of the use cases that we've seen recently or seen by a lot of teams, they kind of want to do things that are a bit more sensitive, right? Like, uh, for example, there's a lot of use cases around storing private keys inside of a contract. Imagine you have a contract, I mean, this is like the idea of a count abstraction. You know, imagine you have a contract that stores a private key, to an Ethereum wallet where it doesn't have to be secret, and you can spend that by certain amount, of, by certain policies or all that. Or imagine there's a DAO, right? A full out of seven, but the DAO also has a contract that keeps it in check. In check, it can't just like rug pull all of the treasury and assets from the community. It gotta abide by specific rules. So those are use cases that like we're really uh, excited about. But I do think that for those use cases, like you can't 
jasmine iron teas, but teas are like an extremely important component. So for example, one thing that we're doing right now is the contract keeps a share of those keys, so like a piece of the key, and then the end users, or if it's a DAO, it could be like a multi-sig of R07, um, they keep like the other shares of the keys. And then you can start to do all these kind of really, really cool things. Um, and I think that we're going to see a lot of use cases in that direction. I see by a show of hands who knows what oblivious RAM or ORAM means. All right. That's a lot less than like who knows what ZKP is or trusted setup. I, I hope that that's not the case uh, next year. Um, I think there's a very you know important issue. Um, there, there's basically an ORAM-sized hole in the current uh, production of um, you know, TE-based smart contracts. It's true for both Oasis and Secret, and to I think a lesser degree of um, the others like Fala and Obscuro. Um, MobileCoin knows exactly why they need to implement it. Um, you need to hide the access pattern between your storage system and the untrusted world in your you know, trusted hardware enclave. Um, so right now, I mean, I think that there's a perception that you can just take an ERC-20 token and port it to Oasis automatically and get like sender-receiver privacy, or that you could do this with SNP-20 tokens in secret and get sender-receiver privacy. Um, but, but that's just not the case due to the uh, storage access pattern leaking this. So our, our build-a-thon project this week is called Spicy Printfs the Honest Block Explorer, and it will show you know, what information is revealed through the store's access patterns. Um, I, I think the simplest answer is that right now it is not trivial. I mean, there, there's some awareness of this model uh, of what's actually going on that I think that the application developers um, need to come to. Maybe in the future the platforms will you know, unilaterally hide this, um, but right now I think, um, I think we're very early at the you know, learning and understanding of um, you know, what are the security issues around TEs? I think a lot of people just have, you know, turned off looking at it because they don't like the model in the first place, they don't like SGX. Um, you know, we, we have this culture that developed the hard way in smart contracts about, you know, white hat hacking and pointing out security flaws in smart contracts. I mean, it took however, like, billion dollars of hacks over years to, to get there. Um, we're early in that process now, and so, you know, I hope by the time next year a whole lot more people, the kind of ones who look for bugs in, in smart contracts on Ethereum, might also be looking for, uh, you know, better ways of explaining and understanding the nuances and building a secure system around a TE. Awesome. I think that was a great note to end on. Thank you guys very much. I think we're out of time. I wish I could take audience questions, but for anyone who has any questions, feel free to either, um, you know, meet with the panelists afterwards, or uh, you know, how, how can they contact you guys? Twitter. Or is this too confidential? <laughs> right here in person. Just go talk to us. Yeah, just go talk to us. But Twitter is good too, teams are open. Cool, all right, thank you. Thank you.